See? It's good to be here. Amen. So I love uh, just a chance anytime I can to share from God's Word. And uh, I'll try to get out of the way of the screen. I might have to make a little yeah. adjustment here. Um, so today, greetings from the church that also meets here at this building. There's one church. Amen? Amen. So uh, what I wanted to do, what I wanted to start with is, um, I know, um, just in speaking with, with uh, text and Eddie and, and just hearing, I know that he, he um, you know, had, had a health kind of concern and, and, and just want to pray over him and healing. I know uh, Pete as well has been having some, some health issues. And so um, I just want to go to God in prayer right now. And um, if, if you also are wanting a prayer for help, would you just raise your hand this morning if you've got something that's going on? Okay, I see a few hands. Um, I know this. Uh, the end of Mark, it says that these signs will follow those who believe. And one of those are the lay the hands on the sick and they'll recover. Yes. Yes. And so we just want to be bold in the authority we've been given with the Spirit of God that lives within us. And so if you can, um, uh, just join me in prayer and we'll pray in faith. Father, we just want to come to you now. I just want to especially pray, um, um, Eddie and Pete, on my mind as far as your healing. And God, we ask as your children for healing and restoration, Lord. And we know that your word says that if we know that you hear us, that we can know that we have what we've received. And so, Father, I pray that we walk in faith of your healing and your timetable. And I pray that for each individual who raised their hand this morning, who's in some type of suffering um, physically, Lord, I just pray for your healing upon their life, that you would touch them and that we would be faithful in believing in your healing. And so we pray this all in your son's name this morning. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord. All right. So I am excited to share with you. Um, we have been blessed. We've been going through the book of Galatians at, um, down the hallway. And so I just wanted to kind of share where we've gone, where we've kind of come in our study of Galatians and kind of the, the, the kind of concluded with you today. So we'll be in Galatians 6 most of our time. But to begin with. I wanted to just, in Galatians, there is an issue. Paul is writing a letter to Christians, and in verse 6 and 7, he says this. Galatians 1, 6 and 7, it says, I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you into the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Not that there is another gospel, but there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. And so what's going on is that there are those who believe in Christ. There's those who believe that we are saved by faith in the work of God. However, there are some people that are coming in and saying, no, it's not just your faith in Christ, but you have to add to that your merit by, by works of the law. And he's saying that that is a distortion of the gospel. In verse 16 of chapter 1, it says this. Um, uh, uh, where, I'm sorry. Okay. I was pleased to reveal the son to me in order that I might preach him among the Gentiles. I did not immediately consult with anyone, nor did I go up to Jerusalem. I'm sorry. This must be 2.16. Yeah, okay, so basically in that context in chapter 1, he's saying there's some who are trying to give you a different gospel. He's saying, listen, my God, the gospel I got, it was straight from Jesus. It was a revelation of Jesus from Jesus on the road to Damascus. So we get to chapter 2 and in verse 16 there it says, Yet we know that a person is not justified by the works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. So we also have believed in, in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith. In Christ and not by works of the law because by works of the law no one will be justified so whether it is faith in Jesus and the merit of following the Old Testament law or whether it is faith in Jesus and the merit what we have done is we've turned the good news of Jesus sometimes into a merit of having all the right doctrine that you have to believe all the right things. And that is also the merit that, that, that earns your right. That's a distortion of the gospel. 
It's also a distortion of the gospel to believe that, that salvation is from faith in the finished work of Jesus and I have to have all the good works myself. That too is a distortion. It is simply in faith in his work and his work alone. And Paul spends a lot of time on that point. Um, in chapter 3, this verse I really love because I think when we come to faith and we have faith in the Lord and what he's done, Oh, I think I lost my connection here. Oh, you um, Oh, just, you do. I'll I'm just try to give you more. Space. Yeah, that's fine. I think when we come to faith in the Lord, sometimes we believe that it's the second chance. That we come to the Lord and we're saved, and then it's up to us again to kind of maintain this place that we have with God. And it kind of goes back on to, to us. Look at what it says in chapter 3, verse 3. It says this. Are you so foolish, having begun by the Spirit, the work of God, whose Spirit is within us by faith in that, are you now being perfected by the flesh? This is something that we fall into, where we believe we're saved by faith alone, but then we tend to feel like it's on us again. Okay? And... Um, Chapter 5 of Galatians, verses 3 and 4, it says this. It says, I testify again to every man who accepts circumcision. Now, this is a merit of, of adding a law to uh, the Old Testament law. Uh, who accepts circumcision that he is obligated to keep the whole law. It says, you are severed from Christ. You who would be justified by the law, you have fallen away from grace. So in their case, there was someone that was trying to convert them into Judaism, which was basically the merit of the flesh. If we feel like we're saved by any addition other than the work of God, any merit of the flesh, it says that you have fallen from grace, you are severed from Christ. And in chapter 5, if we know that we're, we're saved by His work, in chapter 5, it says this in verse 13. It says, For you were called to freedom, brothers. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. This, this freedom that we experience is a freedom that is from the condemnation of sin. Okay? It doesn't mean that we will never have sin in our life. Okay, so I've used this example. Say you have seasonal allergies, all right? And then you learn about the news of local honey. And then when you take that local honey, you, you don't have the symptoms anymore, okay? There's still pollen in your life, but the effects of pollen have been taken away. That is the freedom that we have in Christ. It doesn't mean that we will be sinless for the rest of our life. But the effects of sin no longer take effect. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ. Amen? Yes. Okay, so he's saying, if you know that it's by faith in the work of Jesus, and you have freedom from sin, don't use that as an opportunity then to just seek out sin in your life. So chapter 5 is really about being led by the Spirit and not by the flesh. And so we come to chapter 6 this morning, and... Our, not only are we to be led by the Spirit, but what we walk by, we sow into. What I mean by that is our actions, we are sowing for something. Um, it, the actions that we take by the influence that guides us is sowing for a harvest. Um, in chapter 6 and in verse 1, it says this. Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual, that is, those who are being led by the Spirit, not seeking to abuse the freedom that we have, but those who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. So what's going on here? He's saying if you're led by the Spirit... And you see anyone who's caught in transgression, you are to restore them. This word restore is to mend what has been broken. How I many of you know what setting a bone is that's been broken? Okay? And if you don't know, 
Setting a bone is, say you go to the doctor, you have an arm that's broken, and they'll try to set the bone if they can, which is this quick, painful realignment of the bone. But once they do that quick, that quick adjustment, that allows for the bone to have complete healing. If you are just led by the flesh, okay, you're just, you're abusing the freedom from sin that we have. I'm just going to live for the flesh. When someone's caught in transgression, you probably just ignore it. I'm too busy. I, I, that doesn't benefit me. Okay? It's a quick adjustment that brings healing. Okay? It would be easy to ignore, but there's a warning those for those who are spiritual. For some people, they just may ignore that. Just continue to be led by the flesh. But for those who are spiritual, this call to restore them, he gives a warning. He says to do it in a spirit of gentleness. The way in which you're seeking restoration. Um, I don't think, he goes on to say, lest you to be tempted. I think the way that I've heard this, um, this passage before was, if you're trying to restore someone who's caught in sin, be careful of being tempted or you'll be sinning with them. I don't think this is about contagious sin. Like, I don't think that the temptation is that you will be tempted with what they're being tempted with. I think the temptation is the way in which you are seeking restoration. If you're seeking to be led by the Spirit, guess what? You can do the things that God is leading you to, but in the wrong manner, in the wrong heart. So instead of having a spirit of gentleness, you may have a harsh, self-righteous condemnation towards someone, as opposed to gentle and self-aware and, and coming to them in love. So uh, I'm, I'm toying with this phrase. I don't know if it's helpful or not, but if we want to be led by the Spirit, we can, we can try to sow in the Spirit's garden to reap in the garden of the flesh. Now, I think that's what's going on here in this case of restoration. They're being led into restoration, but you can do it in the wrong spirit. You can do it for the wrong purpose. You know, you could do it because, you, like, I'm better than you. Like, this is something for me. There is the heart behind what we do. Um, doing the work of God for self is, um, I think, what we're seeing here in this in the beginning of Galatians six. Um, we go to check verse two. Bear with one another's bur bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. That's going to that brother of restoration, the spirit of gentleness and of love. Bear with one another, uh, bear another's burdens, and fulfill the law of Christ. For if anyone thinks he is something, when he is nothing, he deceives himself. But let each one test his own work, and then his reason to boast will be in himself alone and not in his neighbor. For each will have to bear his own load. Say you're being led by the Spirit in your life. There can be a twist that, that, that the evil one will try to get it back to your flesh. I'm, I'm, I'm being led to restoration, but I'm doing it in the wrong spirit. It says here, for if anyone thinks he is something, right? Like if any of you, myself included, if anyone thinks we're something, here's the news. You're nothing and you're self-deceived, right? You've deceived yourself. And um, I learned something uh, when I was a newlywed. My wife and I went to a conference where we heard this. It was kind of news for us, but the, the mentality that was given to us in marriage was to think, I have no rights. I have no rights, which sounds weird. What do you mean I have no rights in a marriage? If everything I do in marriage is in service and everything I receive is in appreciation, it, it will bless your marriage tremendously. For the one who thinks you're anything, entitled, someone who thinks there's some, there is nothing and you have deceived yourself. That's why I think it says, but let each one test his own work, his own work, right? Test his own work, and then his reason to boast will be in himself alone and not in his neighbor. 
So I think what he's saying is, what can you boast in where credit is not shared? Right? Like, that you would do the work of God, but for you? Mm. Test your own work. What, do, what can you actually contribute solely to you? Right? So for the example of life, none of us came to life by our own will. Right? Um, in Genesis 1, it talks about when God said, let there be light. Do you know, this is fascinating to me, but this is only knowledge that's been known for about 10 years now, that at the moment of conception, on a microscopic level, there is a flash of light. Yes. Let there be light in every single individual. Um, so you can't, you, you have shared credit. You don't have any credit when it comes to life, right? When you are born, guess what? You need a lot of caregivers. Without caregivers, you will soon die. Every skill you have, talent you have, is either taught, modeled, inspired, nurtured. Even the breath that we are breathing right now is a gift. Amen. And so I think the message is here to do God, the will of God, be led to do, in this example, restoration, in the wrong spirit for yourself. You need to check yourself. What what can you even claim? What can you boast in that's not shared in your neighbor? So, don't walk out the actions of the Spirit for the harvest of your flesh. Doing the right things in the wrong heart, in the wrong spirit. The flesh, it will deceive us. It goes on to verse 6. Let the one who is taught the word Share all good things with the one who teaches. So this is speaking about financial support to our spiritual teachers. Okay, here's an example of bearing one another's burdens in love in the right spirit. Um, 1 Corinthians 9, 10 and 11 speaks to this. It says, the plowman should plow in hope and the thresher thresh in hope of sharing in the crop. If we have sown spiritual things among you, is it too much if we reap material things from you? So in giving to those, giving to the church, giving to the ministry, giving to those spiritual teachers, you are being led by the spirit for the spirit, not for you. Now you can give in a wrong spirit. You know, you don't give to be a golden giver. Some kind of elite status or, you know, something that is for you. That's the harvest for you. No, we are to give so to the spirit, not to the flesh. So when we come to verse um, seven, here's where we learn about this reaping and sowing. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever one sows, that will he also reap. You reap what you sow. So if I'm, if I want to be led by the spirit and I'm trying to restore a brother who's in sin and the wrong spirit, the harvest that I guess I'm seeking is self-righteousness. If I give something led by the spirit to give, but it's for the flesh harvest, again, it's that, I, that, that I'm seeking that self-righteousness. In verse 8 it says, For the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. But the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. So you can spend your life sowing to your own flesh. Like the things that I do, like our actions, that's what the sowing is. Okay? So my actions, like my energy, my 9 to 5, my passion, you can... You can sow to your flesh for the flesh. Guess what? That's corruption. In what way? I think when we hear corruption, we think evil, we think sin. But this word corruption is just that which is subject to corruption, that which is perishable, what will decay. So if I, if I, if I sow all my actions, my nine to five, and I purchase my house, guess what? That's corruption. Not in an evil sense, but it's perishable. It will decay, right? So if I, if I pour all my effort for myself, for toys, for cars, for you, you name it, all of those things are perishable versus what is eternal, right? When we sow to the flesh for the flesh, that, that those are things that just will decay. 
But when we sow, when our actions are done in the spirit, not for ourselves, but truly just out of gratitude for what we have in the Lord, we're sowing to eternal life. We're sowing to eternal life, not something that, that we will experience when we die. Yes, we will experience eternal life when we die, but we experience eternal life now. Jesus says, this is eternal life, that you know the Father and that you know this is the one in whom he sent. This intimacy, this relationship that we have with the Lord. So if our life, our actions, the purpose behind what we do is not for ourselves, but for God, we will experience relationship with the Lord in what we do. In Colossians 3.23, it says, whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men. In verse 9 it says, And let us not grow weary of doing good, for in due season we will reap if we do not give up. And this is such an important principle, understanding in due season. All right, I'm just going to check to make sure everybody's here. How many of you want to be led by the Spirit? Okay. How many of you want to, in your life, the things that you do to be Spirit-led? Okay, the message here is do not grow weary in doing good. You have to understand the due season. Let me give you an example. I have a, uh, a fruit tree, I have a lemon tree in my backyard. So far, there's no fruit on it. Okay, I'm not going to go dig it up in the backyard because I have a hope that in due season, it will produce fruit. Okay, here's another example. Um... Do not expect the sowing of working out to produce the harvest of better health without the due season. Okay? If you go to the gym and you have an extremely hard workout, don't come the next day to the mirror and expect to see the fruit, the harvest of working out. Without the due season, there's not the harvest. And the same thing is true as we live our life trying to be led by the Spirit to do things not for ourselves but for God. There is a harvest when we sow to the Spirit in our life, but it is in due season. And I'm not, again, not talking just about when we die. Um, here are some examples. The different seasons of sowing to the Spirit. For example, salvation. This is this is the best one. Because guess what the season of salvation is? It's like that. Yeah. <laughs> you can go separated from God to being perfectly righteous before him in an instant because of the work of God. Faith in his work. Amen? Yeah. Okay. However, you may give your life to the Lord. Tomorrow, you're probably not ready. You haven't had the due season to give wise counsel. Okay? There, there's a due season of that. The oneness of marriage, growing close to one another in a marriage relationship. Guess what? You're going to have ups and downs, and that comes in due season. The marriage bed comes in due season. The harvest. Children's blessing comes in due season. You know how hard it is to raise children? Yes. <laughs> when they're small, when they're a little bit bigger. when They're, they're hard, okay? And there's some times where they want to, they, they don't appreciate you. There's some times where they want to dis, disappoint you in, the, in their actions. There is a blessing, and scripture speaks about it, in due season. Um, friendship comes through the due season. If, I'm, if I approach any of you and ask you to be my best friend, you might be like, it's kind of weird, right? Because it takes that time, it takes that season to, to reap the harvest of friendship. Paul himself, um, earlier on in Galatians, when he met Jesus on the road, he then spent three years in Arabia, okay, the very place where Mount Sinai and the ritual word of God was given. He spent three years there, and then he spent 14 years back in his hometown before he did any missionary work. There was a due season in the life of Paul before he even went to these churches to write letters to them. So don't forget that. So as we're going to go back real quick, let us not grow weary of doing good for in due season we will reap if we do not give up. Verse 10. So then 
As we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone and especially to those who are the household of faith. So if you can see behind here, this is where we're located. Okay, here's the building, the parking lot is right here. Um, as we have opportunity, as the Spirit leads you, don't grow weary in doing good. Can any one of you accomplish everything that the Lord needs to do in this church? No. Not, not, there's not like one person that the Lord's going to do. The Lord wants the body of Christ to work. And this is as you have opportunity, as you're led by the Spirit to fulfill the, the, the works that you feel led into, not for you, but for God, take those opportunities. And what I want us to really see is where it, the, 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 the emphasis is. Let us do good to everyone, and especially to those who are of the household of faith. I wonder, I'm not here with you week in and week out, but I wonder if there are many opportunities within the household of faith here that meet every week, that there aren't opportunities that are not being taken. Maybe there's a weariness that, that you have instead of seeing the opportunities. If we as the body of Christ walk into the opportunities of doing where we feel the spirit led, there will be a harvest in due season. And so that just gives me excitement for the church if we adopt this, this way of thinking. In verse 11, it says, See with what large letters I am writing to you with my own hand. I'm going to take a moment here to explain at least what I believe. Some people will take this scripture and, and a couple other scriptures and they'll make a theory that what Paul is speaking about is he has poor eyesight and that's why he had to write in large letters. The word here is grandma. It, grandma means a letter, any writing document, uh, a record. And what Paul is saying is, look at this large letter that I've sent you. The ESV translated here letters. Um, but he's, he's speaking about the emphasis. We'll see that in the context. But um, another, there's another commentary. Even if it is these individual characters, um, here's a commentary by J.B. Phillips. He says, uh, notice how heavily I have pressed upon the pen in writing this. Thus it could be translated, notice how heavily I am emphasizing these words to you. He wants them to understand this walking in the Spirit, being led by the Spirit, for the Spirit, in contrast with how others are em emphasizing their message. As we continue verse 12, it is those who want to make a good showing in the flesh who would force you, there's their emphasis, who would force you to be circumcised and only in order that they may not be persecuted for the cross of Christ. For even those who are circumcised do not themselves keep the law but they desire to have you circumcised that they may boast in your flesh. So those who are pressuring them to add to their faith the, our merited works, they are sowing to the flesh. They're sowing to the flesh out because they're trying to avoid persecution, right? They're, they're sowing to the flesh because they want to boast in their conversions of them. So I would never go into my neighbor's yard and sow something so that I could reap it in my yard. Makes sense, right? Nobody would do that, right? In the same way, if I am being led by the Spirit, I should never expect to, to, to do the works where I feel the Spirit is, is leading me, but to reap the benefit in my flesh. That it's for me. And, and a spirit that is still for me. It goes on in verse 14. But far be it from me to boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. By which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. So you see this dual crucifixion here. That I would be that the world has been crucified to me. The world has nothing to offer me. 
The world's been crucified to me. That's people's greatest fear often, that the world has nothing more to offer them. But that actually becomes our greatest understanding. Right? I, the world's been crucified to me, and I to the world. I have nothing to offer the world except the cross of Jesus. The, the reason why I, why I do where the Spirit leads me is for Him and not for me. Verse 15, for neither circumcision counts for anything nor uncircumcision, but a new creation. Seeking a harvest in the flesh is corruption. The true harvest is becoming a new creation, which is nothing that you did, but faith in what he did. This is one of my favorite verses in 2 Corinthians 5, 17. I think I might have shared this with you last time I was here. The 2 Corinthians 5, 17, it says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself. And as for all who walk by this rule, peace and mercy be upon them and upon the Israel of God. From now on, let no one cause me trouble, for I bear on my body the marks of Jesus. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit, brothers. Amen. So as Paul is being led by the spirit, there's, there's evidence of that in his own body. He's not walking by the flesh. He's not led by the flesh. He's led by the spirit. And he's led by the spirit, not for himself, but for God. And for that, there was evidence on his body. He was beaten. He was stoned. If we are led by the Spirit, and it's not for us, it's not for self-righteousness, it's so not that we feel better, that people see us differently. If, if we are led by the Spirit for God alone, there will be evidence of that in our life. Mm -hmm. Evidence in our calendar. Mm -hmm. Evidence of our time. Evidence in our dreams. That, that, would, that, that we would live out, it would be evident in our life. And Paul had scars to prove that. So in Galatians, there is a lot of talk about the flesh. Do not trust in the flesh for salvation. Do not walk by the influence of your flesh. In fact, crucify the flesh. And do not sow into the flesh. So here's what I would leave you this morning <clears throat> to any if there's any here who are unsaved are you ready to look at the finished work of God and trust in him not trust in your flesh anymore to say here's the message what harvest are you seeking is it still for you because if it's for you you will reap from the flesh and also do not grow weary listen there are opportunities Make every opportunity as you're led by the Spirit to, 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 to fulfill what, where the Spirit's leading you for God. And in due season, there will be a harvest. So right now, there's a, there's a project at my house. I've got to got redo one of our bathrooms. And uh, there it is. The, whole, the bathtub's out. All the shower walls are out. And I know that I'm going to have to do a lot of learning this week as I take tackle that project. My flesh really doesn't want to do it, right? But why I do it is I know that as I take it one step at a time, there will be a harvest. It will be done. I'll have a brand new, you know, bathroom, bathtub, and tiles. And so that harvest is what, what, what motivates the, the work. The spiritual harvest that we can experience in this life is not just for the afterlife. Don't grow weary. Be led by the Spirit, not for yourself, but for Him. And in due season, you will reap the harvest. Let's pray together. Father, we just want to come to you this morning. And Lord, as we just open up this message, this letter from Paul to the churches of Galatia. Um, Lord, I know there's a lot. I know there's a lot there. 
Um, one thing we know is that we're not made right by the flesh. But one thing that we know is that we are not to be led by the flesh. And so, Lord, as I speak to brothers and sisters in Christ this morning, I pray that we will desire to be led by you, but not for our harvest, not for our, our good reputations or self-identity, but, Father, that we would be crucified in the world, that we have nothing to offer the world except for your work and what you've done. And, Lord, we know that if we live a life of sowing to the Spirit, being led by you, doing your work for you, Lord, we believe and trust in the harvest that you have for us. So we pray this blessing for this church, and it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Thank you.